find it dark. Does that not work? They, the, the way they set up the lights is really strange. Fantastic. That's pretty good. So you can go from one extreme to the other. You can have the rectilinear axis, just 
the standard basis, orthogonal, and if it's replicated at every point, or you can have frames which move around from point to point. The only criteria there being that these things are always not orthogonal. I don't, maybe I don't mean orthogonal. Maybe I just mean linearly independent. You don't even need orthogonality. Okay, so what I want to do is call this thing here TP for tangent space at P of R3. Okay, so each, each, uh, each, um, each point P carries its own uh, tangent space. All right, and it's a, it's a sort of boring tangent space. It's a three-dimensional, it's a replica, it's a, co it's a copy of R3. Maybe you've chosen the basis in a weird way, but the tangent space that goes, goes here is just a replica of R3. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. Are all tangent spaces tangents to a surface, or is every tangent to a surface a um, In this, the way I'm explaining here, uh, there are two different things. There's no surface involved here, so this is the, but the, the background space is R3, so the geometric object is R3, and these are the tangent spaces of R3. If you were to have a surface, then you would have tangent spaces of that surface, and they really would be, they really would visualize those as, you know, planes tangent to the surface. Okay, um, right. Okay, so one, one um, characterization, so it's not the character, what does it say? I should have labeled it differently. Um, shouldn't have been characterization, I should have been construction, because the standard construction of tangent vectors, so what's a tangent vector? A tangent vector is one of these guys. So this is x at p, uh, maybe you like to put, maybe you know, different geometry from it, because the point P matters where the vector is located. So you put a little substrate P below the X to say this is a vector sitting at P. So this XP belongs to the tangent space um, at R3. Okay, so a standard construction, which is useful for proving things and for just understanding how curves fit into all of this and sort of understanding the picture of things. So a very useful character construction of tangent vectors is as follows. So what you have is you, you, you propose that there's a curve, that there's a curve whose tangent is the given vector. So let's say it's, it's going to be some curve like this. This is your C of T. So I'll describe that in a second. So you use curves to construct these tangent vectors. So you say, you say that um, x at p is equal to the derivative uh, of c of t at t equals to 0, where um, c is you know, a small little piece of curve, uh, something like minus epsilon to epsilon into r of 3, small curve. And you have c at 0 is equal to p. So the, uh, the right, so then the, the C of zero is this uh, is this point here. Okay, so this is a standard way of just expressing vectors. You say that for every vector you can find a curve. If you if you want to talk about vectors, you can talk about vectors on their own, or you can talk about um, the curves which generate these vectors. Um, how many curves can you have that generate a single vector? Is there a unique curve that I have to work hard to find, or, or what? Okay, so, you're, so your, your instinct is that there's lots of possible ways of doing this. What's one example of a curve that generates a, a vector? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Just a straight line. Will you find a straight line that passes through that point? So let's say non-unique. So one example is the straight line. C of t is equal to t times the vector x of p plus p, right? If you differentiate this uh, dc by dt, you get um, x. If you plug in t equals to 0, you get the point p. So that's one example. And um, others, what about others? Well, the one that I drew there certainly intended it. You can imagine taking the straight line and like bending it a bit, but not near the point, not at the point. You bend it everywhere else. Does that make sense? 
Anyway, I just want you to get in your mind that there's lots and lots and lots of ways of constructing a, a curve that goes through here, but somehow um, you know, the, the, the tangent vector at the point P is all that, is all that matters.
functions. There are m component functions for a function that maps into our m, just like there are three component functions for a curve. Okay? So um, now that you have this thing here, right, you can now compute all of these. There's lots of this. In fact, n times m of these guys. So there's lots of these guys. And to make sense of all of these things, um, what you do is, at least in Math 51, what you did was you uh, stuck them into a matrix, which we call df at p. This is the differential um, of a function at p. And this is just a matrix which contains all of these partial derivatives at p. So all of these possible partial derivatives. So math if you want, instead of treating each um, uh, partial derivative sort of as its own special thing, it just assembles them all and sticks them all into a matrix. Okay, well, what's the big deal with this matrix? This is what we're going to talk about now. I want to say that this matrix is in fact, it's important to, to group groups. It's important why we stuck these things into a matrix. A matrix is a linear transformation, right? It's a, it's a linear algebraic object. It's a linear transformation. So the question is, what is it a linear transformation of? Well, if you assemble it in this way, um, okay, so what kind, of, what kind of a matrix is this? Um, let's get the numbers right. So what you do is you put df1 by dx1 here. You go all the way up to df1 by dxn. And then you go all the way down to dfm by dx1 over to df of m by dxn. So this is an m by n matrix. So that means it's going to be a linear transformation between an n-dimensional space and an m-dimensional space. Right? So in fact, it's a linear transformation. It's a linear transformation from here, the tangent space of Rn, over to the tangent space of Rm. This is an n-dimensional space. And this over here is an, is an m-dimensional space. Because really, at every single point, you have a copy of just the original Rn, but we just decided to treat them as you know, existing at separate points. Okay. So the numbers work out. The f of p sends a vector of size n to a vector of size m. So the numbers work out. And we kind of think that, um, that the differential should be anchored at the point where we start. Right? You know, the, the partial derivative is varied from point to point. Right? So to choose a point where you evaluate it. It's evaluated in p, which means our um, differential has to act on tangent vectors that live at p. Okay, what goes here? Goes right there. Well, <laughs> okay, we don't look at the slide. Um, what goes here? Yeah, whatever p gets sent to. So let's change colors here. So this is f of p. Right? So the sum of the idea is that this differential maps the tangent space at the source point to the tangent space at the target point. Okay? So um, let's draw a picture and then interpret it in a second. So here's the transformation, here's the picture. So the picture is this. So here's, um, what is the picture? Uh, okay, so here is, here's Rn. Here's F. Here's Rm. Okay, so here's going to be the point P and we're going to put um, an orthonormal basis here. Just you don't have to put an orthonormal basis here, but we're going to, we're going to do it. This is um, T P at R M, and then you get another point over here. Say you get F of P over here, and you have. Uh, let's change colors. Actually. You have. Um, T P, T sorry, F of P at R M. 
Okay, now linear transformations, they move vectors around, right? So, in fact, if I'm going to make this picture correct, I better draw the images of the coordinate vectors. So let me call this vector E1, and let me call this vector E2. And I don't know, maybe, maybe this is the vector D, F, P acting on E1, and maybe that over here, maybe it's even short, let's say, is the vector um, D, F, at P acting on E2. Maybe it's something like that. Okay, so you want to have a picture of a linear transformation in your mind. How do you do it? Well, you, you, need, you need two vector spaces, the green and the red, and then you need sort of the action of F on those vectors. So we're going to say that the green vectors get somehow transformed to the green vectors on the other side. Okay, uh, right. So DF is the operation which takes this tangent space here, the picture's getting really busy, sorry about that, to this tangent space here. There's DF at P. Okay? Okay. So this is somehow the structure that is uh, that, that uh, we get when we assemble all the partial derivatives into a matrix. Okay, let me let me now um, move to the next slide or the next point here, because I want to justify this picture a little bit. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do a calculation, and then you'll see you'll see that uh, I have, well, hopefully that'll be sort of a justification in your mind of why this picture holds. Okay, so the question that I want to answer now is why is this picture true? So what we're going to do, what we're going to do is use these curves. Okay. So what we're going to, the way we're going to justify this picture is we're going to. I'll, I'll, I'll do this formula down here. I'm going to use the um, interpretation of tangent vectors as um, directions of curves. Okay. And then, then you're, what you're going to see is there's a linear transformation happening. Okay. All right. So uh, what we do is we're going to say let C of let C be one of these little short curve guys. where c at 0 is equal to p, and um, dc by dt at 0 is equal to some vector x at p. And let me go ahead and write this vector as um, um, a1 up to a, how many do you need n of them, a n. So this is with respect to the standard basis. Which, of course, I can copy and I can have a standard basis at every point P if I choose. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to put another bullet point here. But let's have a picture first. Let's get a picture started. So the picture is, here's my, um, here's my Rn. Here's my point P. And I want to say that I have some kind of curve. It doesn't matter what it is. It's short. The rest of the curve doesn't matter. Only the part of the curve right at this point matters. And this is the vector a1 up to an, the vector x at p equals this. So this is what I have. Okay? All right. And I have, of course, my mapping f, which takes me over into the next space, rm, and then somewhere else is the point f of p. Okay, so I can move the point P forward um, under F, but I can also move the entire curve forward under F. Right? I can move the whole curve forward under F. So, um, what does the, the, the moved forward curve look like? 
what's this formula? If I, if I, if I want to take a curve over here, this is C of T, and I want to move it forward to here. What is the formula of that? F of C of T. Yeah, it's F of C of T. It's the composition, right? You take F, of, you take C of T, you plug it in F, you get the curve moved forward. So that's going to be some uh, some different curve. Let's say it looks, yeah, it looks it looks different enough, I guess. This is F compose C of T, and this vector here, this is. This vector we know. This is d by dt of f composed c of t at t is equal to 0, and it lives in t sub f of p of rm. M. Right? So if the move forward curve is this guy, f composed c, then its tangent vector is just differentiate f composed c. Right? So we say you get f composed c of t, and the tangent vector is, is just d by dt of f composed c of t, and you need to plug in t equals to 0 when you're done. So this is your tangent vector. Okay. All right, so what I've got now is um, I've got my curve c, I've got my pushed forward, moved forward curve f composed c. I've got my initial starting tangent vector, and I've got one formula for the ending, the final tangent vector. Okay? So what I want to do now is just relate, the, relate this formula for the final tangent vector to the original tangent vector and f itself. My last job. Do you see that? I need to express this quantity here in terms of the original x and something involving f. Then I've got my formula. Okay, so I'm going to go So the next step is just to relate uh, this tangent vector, which is the output tangent vector, and the input tangent vector and the function f of derivatives. Okay, well, that's not going to be so hard if you have spent the weekend memorizing and pondering and uh, understanding the chain rule. Because once again, this is a chain rule calculation. Okay, let's try to do that. So what I'm going to do right now is derive I'm going to start here, and I'm going to do a few steps of derivation, and I'm going to end up there. Okay? All right, here's how it works. So I'm going to differentiate this guy. You get d by dt of f composed c of t. Well, okay, so this is really d, and I need to plug in t equals 0 when I'm done. This is really d by dt of f1 of c of t fm of c of t, right? Because after all, the output of f is a, you know, it's a vector quantity. Ah, okay, so let me just do one of these guys. So let me say this is d by dt of f1 of c of t at t equals to 0, and I have blah, 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 the rest of the stuff. Okay, now we have the derivative of a composition of two functions. Now I can use a chain. Right? So this is, it's df1 by dxi, where you plug in c of t, and then you take dc, or I could say, let's give it a straight d, dci dt, where you plug in uh, t. And at the very end of the day, I plug in t equals to zero. And this goes like this here, 
And let me go ahead and throw in a sum over the i's from 1 to how many other integers? So this is the chain rule. So as I said, every, every, every important calculation in different topography seems to involve either the product or the chain rule. OK, so far so good. OK, now we're going to try to identify the various pieces. OK, so um, that, I guess I'm going, to, I'm going to squeeze that right here, because I actually don't need that much space. Everyone can still see this? Everyone can see both sides of my vector? OK, so if I plug in t equals to 0, what do I get there? What do I get to c of t? Just get p, right? So I've got summation over i from 1 to n of df uh, 1 by dx i at p and dci by dt at 0. That was our original x, right? And I gave the components of x a name, I called them a's. So this is just multiplied by the number ai. And of course, this is true everywhere, it's true all the way down, right? i equals 1 to n of dfj by dxi at p, ai, and then all the way to the end, i equals from 1 to n of dfm uh, by dxi times ai. Okay? Right. Now, this is where your linear algebra sense kick has to kick in. Let's go over here. You need to be able to recognize, just like you need to be able to see when the chain rule applies, you also need to know when you see a matrix multiplication, when a matrix multiplication is staring you in the face. Right? And that's an easier, at least you, I think you guys are more familiar with that skill. So you actually see here that you have a matrix, dx d1 at p, df by dx1 n at p, and then all the way down to df m dx1 over to dfm dxn at p at p, and then multiply the vector a1 through an, and in fact, this is nothing other than, in very short notations, dfp multiplied by the vector xp, which is the formula that I wanted to get at. So the key here was to be able to recognize Well, there were two, two important things, right? There was a chain rule, and then the other important step here at the very end was to recognize that that was uh, a, it's a linear operation. So it's a, it's a matrix multiplication. Okay? So it's because of that. That's, that's the, end of, the end of my calculation. And let me tell you again what the purpose of this calculation was. It was to justify why we can treat df and p as a linear mapping between tangent spaces. The reason is, when you move curves around like this, um, df of p is the linear mapping which moves the curve tangent vectors around. Okay? So that's why, and here's the calculation that proves it's linear. So that's why we can justify df of p as this linear transformation between tangent spaces. Okay? Okay, so that's it for slide number one. Um, we have uh, four slides in this list. <laughs> yeah. Why is it necessary that it be a small curve? Um, it isn't necessary to be a small curve. You can do this at any point on the curve. It's just that the value you get only depends on the derivative, I mean, on the tangent vector of the curve at the point. It doesn't depend on, um, so in other words, different, different depends on the curve in a very local fashion. It just depends on the tangent vector. It doesn't depend on curvature even. It doesn't depend on any higher information. So you really can afford to ignore everything except minus epsilon and plus epsilon. I left, that was it. It's okay, it slows the class down a bit, which apparently from last, my last lecture, that's an important uh, side effect that we need to build in here. Okay, um, any, any more questions? I'll pause for a couple seconds until I gather my thoughts here.
Okay, any more questions about this first slide? Anyway. Okay, let us move forward. Okay, <laughs> they don't get any easier. There is a very simple slide coming up soon, I tell you. There is. Okay. What uh, does so the differential, okay, the purpose of this slide is to some take home message here is that the differential tells you an awful lot about the function. So the, the differential tells you not everything you need to know about f, but tells you an awful lot about f. And in fact, one thing which is important in differential geometry is the so called mapping properties of the differential. In other words, it's a linear transformation, right? It's, is it one to one? Is it onto? Is it bijective? Does it have a kernel? And if so, what is the kernel? Um, how do you characterize the image? For later on, we're not going to do this now, but you know, the orthogonal complement of the image, and all these various linear algebra, the, the singular value, all these various eigenvalues, all these various important um, linear algebraic objects of df matter and tell you something about f. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is just walk through one sort of four case example of this phenomenon, which will be useful in many places. Okay, so this is the qualitative picture of a map that has locally constant rank. Do you guys remember what the rank of a matrix is? It's the dimension of the uh, column space. Or the, or the, or the dimension of the image of the map. And a locally constant, a map, uh, sorry, a function f has locally constant rank. So here's a definition. So we say that the, the function f has locally constant rank k um, on a set, on an open set, u sitting inside r n, if um, the rank of df at p equals k for all p in this set. So I'm just saying the rank doesn't change, at least in a small neighborhood, at least in some set u. Maybe, maybe the function f is kind of more complicated than that, and its rank can be different in different parts, but at least in this region here, the rank is always the same. It's always k, constant rank. OK, so, um, so you have your, you have your so the result which is up on the board here, is your so-called, well, I'm just going to give this general name. I don't think you'll find this name in different geometry textbooks, but let me go ahead and call this collection of results the rank theorems. Um, so what the rank theorems say is that the behavior of df carries over to the behavior of f in just the right way. And I'll explain it in a number. Of, I'll explain it in all these various cases. But the behavior of the differential at p somehow dictates what the function f is like near p. Okay? Provided the rank is constant, if the rank changes, then it's more then it's a more complicated picture, and this doesn't actually apply, and it gets can get quite complicated. But um, locally constant rank is sort of a generic situation, so this at least applies somehow generic. Oh, uh, yeah. If the yeah, omega on the slide is the u in the definition, right? Oh, yes, it is. Pardon me. Yes, it is. Yeah, the omega in that slide is the, yeah, it's my u. So let's go ahead and make that omega, that u and omega, so that it coincides with the omega appearing here. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Okay. Um, right. So I'll walk through this. First thing. First thing I want to say, the first thing I need to explain here, which isn't on the slide, is what do I mean by modify into an, for f into an equivalent f prime? Well, basically, modify, modify means, means change coordinates. So, um, you know, you, like, like, you know, you switch from, you switch, 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 uh, pardon me. You switch from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates um, in the domain and the range. 
And in Cartesian coordinates, the map didn't look so good. But once you switch to polar coordinates, then the map does look good. Then the map does have this form. So modify means there exists a change of coordinates on the domain and the range. So Yeah, so modify means there exists a change of coordinates on the domain of the range so that the change, the, you know, the different function, the coordinate change function, which is f tilde, has the nice properties. Does that make sense? So you, you might not be able to see the nice properties in the Cartesian coordinates you're working with, but if you define the right kind of coordinates, then all of a sudden the new coordinate change map becomes extremely simple. It's like, for example, the function x squared plus y squared. Complicated, quadratic, not complicated. But anyway, quadratic function, x squared plus y squared. When you change the polar coordinates, what happens to x squared plus y squared? It becomes r squared. So it simplifies. It's now expressed in terms of one quantity only. When you change one of the coordinates only, when you change the, from, from rectilinear to polar coordinates. Okay? So, this theorem, which I'm going to explain in a second, um, has to do with existence of coordinates which change the, change the function, but change it into a simpler version of it, into a simpler version. Okay, so I, I didn't want to write a formula down there because it was going to involve too many compositions of functions. But does that, does that make sense? This change of coordinates has to do with? You can write it down if you're interested. But anyway, let me say, um, let me just write the formula down. If, if and we can talk about it afterwards if you want clarification. But really, my f tilde is related to f by coordinate transformations phi and psi in the domain and range. Okay, but we'll leave the formula aside. I think this is reasonably intuitive here. Here. It says that uh, locally speaking, um, you can modify 
f to become f tilde, such that all that f tilde does is it takes a straight line and just sticks it in to the bigger space as a straight line, and there's nothing else to it. So an example of this is curves. A curve is a mapping from r into r3, and usually, you know, you have a straight line, this is your r, maps into the curve to, you know, something like this, right? This is in r3, and then, so this is maybe not usually, let's say, this is before, before we do the modification, and then after you have r going into just a straight line. So some of this straightens out curves. This modification of change coordinates straightens out curves. One second. Just like what happens when you take uh, what happens what happens to the what happens to the um, arc of a circle in Euclidean's plane when you map it forward on the polar coordinates? What happens to the arc of a circle? Uh, does it become, yeah, it becomes a straight line. Yeah, yeah, right, the arc of a circle becomes a straight line, right? So changing coordinates allows you to straighten out the, the curve. Um, yeah, your question, sorry. Okay, so, what's the difference between locally modified and modified? Locally modified means, um, means the modification only happens um, on some small, perhaps small subset um, of this space. These, these functions by and psi only exist on a subset of that space, not on the whole thing, necessarily. Like, you know, when you, when you, when you change from polar coordinates, um, you always have, you have sort of have problems with polar coordinates at the origin, right? And where the, where the angle wraps around. So locally means this straightening out just happens in a small, in a small, like you can only do one small part of the curve at a time. You can construct a change of coordinates in a small part of the curve, which makes it look straight. And maybe elsewhere you have to use different coordinates because the coordinates in the first place don't extend all that, all that, all that way. Okay. Um, case two, if you have a surjective mapping, right, so case two, um, um, case two, um, function f, or df of p is surjective, well, I want to say that I have a modification of f tilde, from f to f tilde, which looks like this. This is kind of a nice, this, is, this has a nice interpretation. How do we interpret this, pictorially or linear algebraically or in words? How would you interpret this kind of an operation? So is it a, yeah, very good, very good. So what's your name? Arun. Okay, so um, Arun says this is a projection. Okay, what's a, how does a projection work? We have this volume of space, right? And a projection works by forgetting much, forgetting several coordinates, right? So in other words, you have a point x1, x2, x3 up here, and you project it down to x1, x2 down on the plane. So you're forgetting the third coordinate. So I guess the case two picture is, so it's a projection. And you have something like this. Here's your Rn bigger than m, and you map down, and you go to an Rm. So the idea is that you know we have a point x comma y, where this is um, this is in Rm, and this guy over here is in R. What's missing? Um, n minus m gets mapped down to this is f tilde f tilde of x, just, you just lose, f, f tilde of x comma y is just equal to x, right? So you just lose the information about the second coordinate. So a surjective differential means, locally speaking, the function f itself kind of works like a projection. It's if you can't see it until you change coordinates. Okay. So case three, Bijective, well, bijective is always easy when you remember, it. well, not always easy, but I mean, one thing you have to remember is bijective means both injective and surjective at the same time. So n equals m, because both these intervals have to hold at the same time. And you kind of have both behaviors at once. 
So you have f tilde x1 to xn equals x1 to xn. This, is a, this mapping f tilde has a very simple interpretation. Right? It's the identity. It doesn't matter. So in the case of df of p being bijective, what we're saying is f tilde is like the identity. Or in other words, f tilde itself is a bijection. Right? f tilde itself is an invertible function. Okay? Does that mean that f is invertible too? If f tilde is invertible, and f tilde is this change of coordinate version of f, does that mean f is invertible? It does, because what's the whole point of changes of coordinates? You can undo them, right? You can, it's just, it's, you can, changes of coordinates themselves are invertible. So if f tilde is equal to an invertible thing, and f tilde equals a change of coordinates on f, then you undo that change of coordinates, and f inherits the structure of f tilde, so f itself is invertible. Okay, um, case four, the f has rank k. Well, um, somehow when, when, when something has rank k, it is both injective and surjective at the same time in some, sorry, sorry. If, 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 sorry, I did, that's wrong. If the fp has rank k, and k is, is strictly smaller than n and m, then you know, the, the rank k is both not surjective and not injective at the same time. That's so it kind of both has a projection aspect to it. So in other words, x1 through xk get projected down, and the rest get forgotten. But also some coordinates get zeroed out, which means there's a kernel there as well. So anyway, let's leave, let's leave this aside, the details aside. Let me just say that if df and p has rank k, then f, kind of be, f itself kind of behaves like a rank k thing. So just think of what a rank k matrix is like, and then f is kind of like that locally. Okay, so this is my, my walkthrough of this slide here. I'm going to switch slides in a second. Um, in fact, we'll do it now. We're not quite finished yet here, so we'll just uh, move forward one. Okay, right, here's my easy slide. This is the take home message of the previous slide. If the F P has constant rank, then F behaves like the F P near P. And that applies when F is injective, surjective, bijective, or has you know, lower, lower rank. So this is the take-home message. And um, proof of this fact follows from um, two key technical theorems in differential geometry, which we won't go into. I just want to state them because you should, um, you should remember what they are so that when they show up, you can say you've seen them and you've sort of got some, some intuition for them. They're the inverse and implicit function theorems. So these theorems, they, uh, they usually fit in a sort of a multivariable analysis class, and you always prove them using interesting techniques and so on. Um, but if the message is kind of is very clear. So the inverse function theorem talks about inverting functions. And again, it's more or less what was in the previous single bullet, uh, the box of the last slide. It's that if f is a smooth function and df at p as bijective, then f itself inherits that um, in a neighboring of p, of course. So, yes, yeah, so f itself is invertible on a neighborhood of p. Right, and of, and of course, I'm putting on this slide here just a reminder that you can check very easily if df at p is bijective because all you do is check whether the determinant is zero or not. So the implicit function theorem is the next theorem. This is slightly more involved. Um, at least the statement is slightly more involved. It involves, it means, it refers to solving equations. So the implicit function theorem is about solving equations. For example, um, f of x comma y is equal to zero, where x belongs to R n, y belongs to R m, and zero here. This is in R. Uh, um, what am I doing here? Uh, sorry, I should 
make this K, and this should be N and N. Okay, this is not a good example of sending something on the board. I'll give you better examples in a second. But I just want to say what's going on here. You have a system of equations, you have a system of nonlinear equations for k plus n unknowns. This is a system of equations in k plus n unknowns. How many equations? How many equations is this? Well, there's a vector of zeros on the right hand side, right? So it's one equation for every zero. With n equations. You have n equations. Okay, what do you expect? If you have k plus n unknowns and n equations, what kind of a solution do you expect? k plus n equations, n, n un, uh, sorry, k plus n unknowns, n equations. How many, how many unknowns can you eliminate? You can eliminate one unknown for every equation. So you kind of expect there to be um, n, n unknowns get eliminated and you have sort of k-free variables left over. Right? So solving, in quotes, means eliminating n variables. And um, the solution uh, is um, is of the form uh, is of the form um, there's a free variable and then there's a um, function of the free variable. So it means to eliminate a variable, right? You can express the eliminated variable in terms of the free variables. So in other words, it looks like x comma g of x, where this is the free variable, and g of x is the is in um, our n. It's one of the unknown. It's one of the uh, you know the g represent all the dependent variables that you've el eliminated variables. So this is precisely what this theorem is saying. Um, yeah, it's not precisely what the theorem is saying. What the theorem is saying is that sorry, more, it's saying that you can solve f of x, y equals zero for the, you can eliminate the, the, the dependent variables and write them in terms of the free variables, um, meaning you can write, uh, you can find a function g of x which does the elimination for you, and you can write the solution as x comma g of x. Um, there's a condition under which that's true, and the condition is something to do with the derivatives. And this d2 um, when you can do this is when d2f is non uh, is, is invertible. And d2f is just the derivatives of um, j in the y variables, which is an n by n matrix. That's what the theorem says. On the other board, I'll give you a, this is an example of sort of pieces together. Over on the other board, I'll give you something way more concrete. Okay. Does, that, does this at least un, unpackage the, the material on, the, uh, on in this bullet point here? Okay. It'll be much clearer if I give you something that doesn't involve N and M and F, but an actual concrete example. Okay, so example, um, I'm going to say n is equal to uh, 3, m is equal to 1, so I'm going to have to say a function f of x comma y comma z equals to, let's go ahead and say x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and I want something reasonable, so I mean something trivial, so let me put a minus 1 there. Okay? And of course, we know that f of, well, we know what this is, right? We know that this is, we know that um, f of x comma y comma z equals to zero when um, x comma y comma z belongs to um, the two-dimensional sphere of radius one, so s2, so 
So in other words, right? um, so your radius one, right? So x comma y comma z is a point on on the sphere, right? Okay. Oh, this doesn't look fully perspective, so let's do it like this, and let's put it here. Okay. All right. Anyway. Um, this is the, the set of the solutions of this equation are the sphere. So what so you want to eliminate the z variable. So what you say is you say z squared equals to um, one minus x squared minus y squared, so z equals to uh, plus or minus one square root of one minus x squared. And, uh, and what you want to do here is you choose plus. You choose plus because, well, because, I don't know, suppose you're, because you want to be, you want solutions near a known value. So let's say we have a known value, which is 0, 0, 1. So you choose, you choose a plus sign because that gives you the solutions nearby, right? So now, so you have your g of x comma y is equal to this 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And, um, and, um, and the solution, the solution is of the form x comma y and then square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. Close back. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So, how does this connect to the implicit function theorem? Well, okay. So, you want to look at d. You want to look at um, d uh, d f d two of f. Let's say, yeah, d2 and f. And this is um, the main, this is because, because n is equal to 1. I mean, n is equal to 1. Oh, shoot. Shoot, these numbers are wrong. I'm sorry. Just realized this. Uh, what are the correct numbers? That should be n. And that should be k plus n. So, k plus 2. Sorry, the numbers are wrong. Now. Okay, well, because n is equal to 1, there's only one, there's only, you know, d2, the set, that derivative in the, in, the, in the dependent variables is only one number. It's df by d, the dependent variable, df by dz. So this is um, equal to uh, 2z. Okay, so when is this an invertible linear transformation? So first of all, it's a linear transformation because it's a scalar. So it's a linear transformation from a one-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space, multiplication by a scalar. When is that transformation invertible? When that scalar is non-zero. When the scalar is non-zero. Okay. So what, what this means is you can solve the equation f of x comma y comma z equals to zero locally um, provided locally uh, near a point provided the z of that point is non-zero. And let me just uh, finish in right here. Okay. Um, Um, okay, so if this makes sense, right? So right here, these points, these points here are where z equals to zero. The points on the equator are where z equals to zero. And that's precisely where the formula breaks down. So the formula right here fails. 
that formula fails to be a reasonable formula near the equator, why does it fail to be reasonable? This square root turns zero. What happens, what, what's the property of the square root function that we don't like when it's zero? Say again? Vertical tangent line. Yeah, exactly right. So the derivative of this function goes bad um, at z equals to zero. And in fact, you can't even go further than z equals to zero because you suddenly get these, you know, the, the negative square roots and so on. So anyway, the whole formula doesn't work near z equals to zero. And everywhere else it's fine. And this is this phenomenon is echoed in the conclusion of the implicit function term. You compute the second derivative, it's this d2. And you know, ev everything is fine, everything is invertible, so long as that is not zero. Okay. So that's the implicit function here. Um, we'll leave off the second point until I need it later. Okay. So let me finish with this slide here. Just to give you some terminology. And once we have those down on Tuesday, I mean on Monday of next week, we'll be able to start with a real definition of the circuit. So we're, we're a slide behind here. No we good. Prefer going more slowly anyway. Okay, so um, what, the purpose of this last slide here is just to remind you of three different kinds of surface representations. Just if you've seen them all before, I just want to remind you what they are. Okay, and in fact, for concreteness, let's stick to R3. So three kinds of surfaces. So the first kind, which you certainly have seen from, you know, from Matthew Duan and other places, is, and even sooner, presumably, So, um, given a function from R2 into R, you construct, you construct what's called its graph. So, so of course, a uh, graph has a very specific meaning um, to computer scientists, which is very different from the meaning that it has in mathematics, or at least in different geometry. Um, so, so, when I use the word graph, I mean the capitalist meaning of the word graph, which is this picture here. So here's your, here's your R2, here's your point x comma y, and what you do is you construct a surface you construct a surface by above the point, let's move this over here, above the point x comma y, you put, you draw a point of height f of x comma y. So this point here, the one that I just drew, the target point is um, x, y, f of x comma y. So this is the this is the output point, right? And the height above the above the axis is um, f of x comma above the plane is f of x comma y. Okay. So, uh, right, so this is, this is the graph of a function. Um, so now the key, the key, uh, uh, so an important limitation is that not all surfaces are graphs. If every surface were a graph, then, you know, then, then our life would be much easier. But unfortunately, not every surface is a graph. For example, the sphere itself, so for example, the sphere is not a graph because it's got a top half and a bottom half, and you can't simultaneously represent the top and the bottom as the, as the same function because, after all, there's only one output that's allowed above every x comma y, right? it's f of x comma y. So, not all surfaces are graph. This brings us to well, to, to other representations. And the next representation, which we saw a little bit of on the other side over there, is level sets. So a level set is you're given a function from R2 into, sorry, into, from R3 into R. A 
function R3 into R, and you want to say your surface is equal to the solutions of, of, an, of the equation of the equation f of x comma y comma z equals to zero. So a shorthand version of this, of this statement right here, is just f inverse of zero. That's a definition right here. Uh, the level set of zero of the function f is denoted f inverse of zero. But what it means is, it means the set of solutions of the equation f of x comma y comma z equals to zero. So you, you get the surface, in quotes, implicitly, because you can't really represent the surface until you've solved the equation. Okay, but remember what we did over there. We eliminated variables. If you have one, you have one equation in three unknowns, you can eliminate one of the variables. And you're left with the, the third eliminated variable in terms of the first two. So generically speaking, provided the implicit function theorem holds, um, this set of solutions is going to be a two-dimensional object. Because it has two free parameters, right? And the third dependent variable depends on the first two. So that's why we say that, and we're going to prove this later, of course, but that's why we say that this is sort of a surface, right? It's a two-dimensional thing. Because you can eliminate one of the three variables, you express everything else in terms of just two dimensions. Okay, and finally, third version of surfaces are parametric surfaces. So, you know, level sets are kind of are kind of not so good because sometimes they're sometimes they're great for representation, other times they're not. And the reason they might not be so good is because they're very indirect. Right? If you have an arbitrary surface out there, you don't know how to construct F such that the surface you have is a solution of an equation, or from the other point of view, if someone gives you this f, maybe you don't know how to solve these equations. Maybe it's x cubed plus y cubed plus tangent of z is equal to, or I guess you can solve that, but anyway, something you can't solve. Um, okay, so maybe you, maybe you don't know how to do that. Well, here's the yet another interpretation, which is the generalization of curves. which is you have a parameterization function which takes you from, from R2 and goes into R3. So I want this to be, um, uh, this is my parameter domain. And um, I want this to be injective. Well, in fact, what I really want is the tangent to be injective for all p in this domain. This is some of the analog of the tangent vector not equals to zero representation of, of curves. We'll talk about this last one later. But in any case, a parametric surface is, um, is an object of this kind. And let me just give you, let me conclude now on one example, which is a nice version of the sphere. The sphere in polar coordinates is an example of a parametric surface. So this is a good formula to have in your back pocket, so I'll write it down here. So for example, uh, the sphere. So uh, here's your sphere, here's the origin, and let's say here's my axis, 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 and I've got my point x comma y comma z, and let me define two angles. There's the angle off of the phi, the angle off of the x-axis, the projection off of the x-axis, and then, there, I don't know the name, it's probably longitude and azimuth is probably the names of these angles. And then there, or maybe that's latitude, I don't know why. Anyway, Theta and phi. Um, phi, th phi is the is the angle you know around. Here's the x-axis. Phi is the angle away. You have to swing away from the x-axis to get to my direction, my point. And theta is how far you have to come down from vertical to get to that direction. Okay, so az azimuth, I think, and longitude, I think, every day. Does that the angle make sense? Okay. Well, I will leave you guys to work out the formula. So. Um, here's, your, here's your parameterization, which say 
sigma is my parameterization of theta and phi equals point one sphere with these angles. And that equals to, okay, here it goes, um, cosine of phi sine of theta, sine of phi sine of theta, and cosine of theta. So there's a, there's a parameterization of the sphere. And my parameter domain is, uh, okay, what are, the, what are the allowed ranges of the angles? It's um, 0 to pi and uh, 0 to 2 pi. And in order for my thing to be injective, I have to, I'm not allowed to wrap all the way around to cut off 0 and pi, otherwise it might overlap, right? Because the value of 0 equals the value of pi, that would be a non-injectivity, so I need them not to overlap. So sort of wrap this parameter surface, parameter um, domain around the sphere, but I leave a little bit out so that the thing remains uh, in, you know, injected. So I'll let you work this out. This is a bit of uh, good exercise in sphere and trigonometry just to just get those numbers right. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, see you guys on uh, Monday. Um, so with the note taker here, fantastic. Okay, um, I've got, I've got. Uh